Okay, can you see that okay? We can, I can see your PowerPoint. Fantastic. Okay, shall I just give you a very quick overview of me, yes. quick bio? Um, God, I've been taking pictures for as long as I can remember, probably over well over 40 years, which is a bit scary. Um, I, I've been a, pro a professional ecologist as well for uh, 30 years. Um, so I get paid to go out and survey these lovely things that I'm going to show you pictures of tonight, uh, which is uh, a real privilege, I have to say. Um, and I thought what I'd do is to just very give you a very quick overview of, of the kit that I'm using currently. Um, I, at the moment, I'm shooting uh, Olympus gear. I don't get paid for this, but I am uh, a, an Olympus mentor, which means I'm on the uh, panel of lovely people that uh, contribute to and feed back to Olympus. Um, and I switched from Canon uh, and Nick, I've used all sorts of camera gear, but I switched from Canon mainly uh, full frame about three years ago. Uh, and although I've got Sony full frame kit, which I run in parallel to this, this is my sort of go to kit for, for macro photography. And I've not found a better system, I'll be honest. Um, and I've I've ringed these these three bits of kit here. Um, uh, and this is on the right hand side, the 300 F4. Um, I, I, that's the macro lens. I mean, it's tiny. That is about the actual size. It's really, really small. Uh, it fits in your pocket. It's a really light, neat piece of kit, um, which I use in conjunction very often with the twin flash, the Olympus twin flash, dedicated uh, twin flash, which works really well with the EM1 Mark III, which is what I'm using currently. Um, top there is the 4150. So uh, bearing in mind, it's got a crop factor. It's uh, essentially a 300 mil f 2.8 lens. Uh, and this is the 300 mil f4, which I'll be um, showing you photographs from tonight. It's a big telephoto, essentially, it's a 600 mil full frame equivalent. Um, so it's a it's a mega lens. But th what these two lenses share is the ability to very close focus gets you almost into macro territory with an extender on. So really, really useful pieces of kit. Uh, I also unfortunately carry quite a lot of gear uh, when I'm uh, when I'm out and about. Um, and these are some of the bits that I use. I've got a couple of plamps, Wimbley plamps. I, I think there are cheaper alternatives on the market now. Uh, a, a tripod, uh, this is one of the Vanguard tripods, which I've got down here, um, which is enables you to get really close uh, to the ground with a tilting head. Um, usually carry a little reflector. A pair of snippers for trimming back unwanted bits of stray vegetation and a remote release. Um, got down here a moth trap, incredibly useful piece of kit actually for attracting uh, some really spectacular beasties to your garden. So if you're feeling lazy like me and you can't be bothered to get up early and drive to site, you can wander out in your dressing gown, check your moth trap and if there's anything interesting, find some perches and do a bit of macro in the garden. Uh, and on the right hand side, and I won't be going into this in detail, but I also do some studio macro work over the winter um, uh, with this lens which is an ultra macro which takes me to about times five life size because macro is uh, around times one and this here is a focusing rail we macro Chinese but very good focusing rail which sits on my bench and um, hours of fun for uh, me for the winter so I, I thought I'd kick off now I've given you a sort of flavor of, of, of what I shoot with um, to look at the um, some of the issues that we're going to be talking about tonight. Firstly, the challenges of macro photography, because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, we've touched on the gear, but I'll be expanding on, on, on that as we work through this workshop. Um, I want to look at some of the habitats that if you're not familiar with insect photography, that you can start to, to look into get a, a better um, chance of finding some good stuff. Um, field craft is really important. I want to look at and uh, I, uh, what I'll do is, is dip in and out of these issues, really, um, and, and relate them, if I can, to the photographs that I'm, I'm showing you online. Um, and obviously some of the basic techniques. Now, I'm, I'm aware that some of you will also be good macro photographers and probably good insect photographers. So I may be teaching some of you to suck eggs, but bear with me. Um, and if you fundamentally disagree, save those comments till last and then I can sign off before you tell me. Um, I want to finish with some Im image stacking. It's something I'm doing more and more of. Um, it's it's a, a, an increasingly used technique because it's something that's starting to be bundled up in camera software now. Uh, in certain, some cameras do do offer that function and the Olympus is particularly good at it. 
So I want to start, uh, kick off by looking at the challenges. Insects are not easy to photograph. I, I think the macro photography generally is, is, is tricky because of the depth of field issues you have. You're working very close to uh, a small, uh, very often um, creature. So you've got that fundamental problem with the, the exposure triangle. You're working at, ideally uh, starting to stop down to smaller apertures to increase your depth of field. But that, of course, affects your shutter speed issue. You need to use a faster shutter speed, uh, sorry, a slower shutter, shutter speed to compensate, which gets you into the territory of struggling with, uh, with movement. Now, the only way around that really is to pump the ISO up. This is assuming you're using daylight. Uh, and not flash to pump the ISO up and then that will affect your uh, ability to capture fine detail. Modern cameras are a lot better uh, than previous generations of camera but it's still an issue. Um, these are still problems that we wrestle with as macro photographers. Subject movement is a, is a real issue out in the field and unless you've got a completely controlled environment and something dead on your bench, subject movement because of wind or because the, the animal is, is skittish because insects move when they get warm obviously uh, is a real problem that we have to contend with and it's, it's always, almost always an issue unless you get out very early in the morning. And, and subject movement um, and the ability to spook insects um, is uh, you know, one of the reasons why I, I increasingly use um, close focusing telephoto lenses now instead of a traditional macro lens, because it allows me to get further away from my from my subjects, which means I spook them less. Um, I want to talk about composition because, uh, you know, as if all those challenges weren't enough, um, you also want to get impactful images, images that are uh, crisp and sharp and clear with a clean background um, that really, you know, stand out and wow the viewer. And uh, finally, uh, finding subjects and, and that allows me to touch on one of my pet uh, um, hobbies as a, as a as a as an ecologist or my pet things as a as an ecologist insects are getting scarcer we're starting to um to see worldwide that insects are under major threat and biodiversity uh loss obviously we know that that's a, a problem internationally but the, the sheer numbers of in insects are dropping and i've st i've noticed this actually when i've been out over the last 10 years really I, I i found um maybe my eyesight but i'm finding it harder sometimes to find subjects there just seems to be generally less around and i think that's the you know the, the experience of a lot of people so let's start by where to shoot you know as a beginner uh, somebody who's just getting to grips with with insect photography where would you go what would you what would you do well the first thing that i would do would be to contact my local wildlife trust and to ideally join it they do some great work and some of them are uh, like all charities they're struggling with um, with covid uh, related issues uh, and they're struggling financially so get yourself out there pay your money join the wildlife trust and that gives you access to a range of nature reserves which will protect a whole host of, of good insect habitats and probably the best and uh, most productive of those is is wetlands um you can also look at grasslands uh, can be great for butterflies, particularly the commoner species. Um, but there's a whole host of other habitats that sometimes get neglected. Scrub is, is potentially really good for finding insect larvae, um, particularly birch and willow scrub, sallow scrub can be great. So that scrub edge grassland and wetland interface is a really good place to start looking for, for insects. And I'll come on to some of the techniques for finding insects shortly. Brownfield sites are uh, what I what I mean by that are these are old industrial sites, few and far between now. It has to be said. So you know, old things like old sewage plants, old railway sidings can be really good, but they can they can be very very diverse in terms of their um, you know early successional habitats, which means they're starting to develop essentially from scratch, and you can find a real variety of good habitats on there, and because they often tend to be you know full of areas of bare ground and very parch they can contain some really interesting invertebrates so definitely good places to start to start looking don't forget your humble garden um the shot in the middle here this won the macro category of the uh, British Wildlife Photography Awards a couple of years back. Uh, and that was taken in my garden when I had a spare half an hour in between um, boring sessions of report writing. It was a perfect um, day for, for macro photography, um, bright overcast, very still, no wind uh, and 
absolutely perfect for image stacking. So I was lucky enough to um, be able to make the most of that half an hour. Before I get on to talking about the the sort of tech, the fundamental techniques, I would say a word about pre-planning. Um, in other words, don't do what I used to do when I started uh, well, started photography, really, which was to drive around to my local patch or Dartmoor, it usually was, um, looking for inspiration, I think, and often coming back with absolutely no images. So pre-planning is really key. Research the site, you know, know what you want to find, know what you're looking for and go at the right time to the right place. So this is a, a marsh fritillary butterfly on the left hand side there's no point in looking for that in in a, a dry improved pasture you need this kind of in, in Devon anyway this kind of calm grassland wet grassland habitat so go to the right place and know your subject you know know its ecological requirements and and you know know where you're likely to find it and at what time of year um, you know understand its food plants you know look in the right place um, be weather wise. Uh, I, I don't get as hung up on weather with macro photography as I used to. I think at one time about 10 years ago, I'd only go out when the weather was perfect, which really severely limited the amount of shots that I took on an annual basis. Um, modern cameras are far better now with, um, I just find I'm a much more flexible photographer. I use a tripod less, often use a monopod or hand, hold, hand holding. Um, and the speed of image stacking in the field now means I'm not quite as dependent on still windless days as I used to be. But be weather wise, keep an eye on things. No point in going out if the weather's really bad. Um, and when you get on site, this is really important. Finding insects is a bit of an art and it takes practice. I, I remember going out years ago with a colleague of mine um, looking for dragonfly larvae and dragonfly exuvia. These are the larval cases. We were doing counts for ecology surveys and he was consistently much, much better better than I am or was at the time and probably would still would be um, and I, I don't know why but he would find five times more dragonfly exuvia than me and it was a real lesson to search really carefully and I have a technique which is to walk into an area like this and I will just scan the vegetation really carefully before walking through it and then I will scan the same piece of vegetation again from a different angle really carefully because very often you can see a perched up insect from one angle but you can't see it from another so take your time move slowly and you start to eventually get to know what you're looking for and when insects are perched likely to be perched up you'll very often pick out the shape like a little shark's fin for a butterfly uh, on the vegetation <sighs> I'm not good at this, I have to say. I'd be a far, far better photographer if I could actually be bothered to get up early in the morning, but I like my bed, I'm afraid. Um, so this is uh, you know, me telling you to do something that I'm not good at. So get up early and get out and make the most of the early morning sun. Um, get to know your local patch as well. No point in uh, incurring a big carbon footprint if you can uh, you know, find good sites locally that you can work and you can really get to know because that will increase your chances of success most definitely. When I get out to site, um, I, 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 I like to be prepared because you never know what you'll find just a few meters from the car. Um, you know, it, I, I think it all, I think this is true of all genres of photography. It takes you a while to kind of zen in to the to the feel of, you know, the day. And, uh, you know, in an ideal world, you've got more than half an hour. I mentioned that earlier on. Um, you know, ideally, you'd have a whole day uh, or a few hours to 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 take your pictures and to, to get used to to get a feel for for where you're where you're shooting especially if it's a new site but i have a mental checklist of things that i like to get set up before i leave the car um, and this is my basic camera setup which i'll modify as the light changes and as i move through the site but generally i set i'm working manually so i set the camera up manually manual exposure uh, manual focus um, I usually start at around 7.1, f7.1, and this is really just for um, my lenses that I'm using from Olympus. These are micro four thirds uh, lenses, and they've got a micro four thirds camera system. It's got a crop factor of 2.1. It's got a, um, a, a bigger depth of field, which can be an advantage for macro photography. 
Um, so that's my sort of starting point. Um, I might increase that to f5.6 or, or maybe stop down slightly, but generally that's my starting point. I'd, I'd you know, want to get a starting point shutter speed of around 250 if just in case I see anything and I'm hand holding. Um, yeah, or, or if there's a bit of wind around, or things are moving around, or it's warm, uh, and I need to stop any action. And this is something that not all macro photographers do. There's this sort of received wisdom that you should shoot everything from a tripod, um, and that you should, you know, um, take your time. And that's true very often, but not always. And uh, my default setting uh, on my camera is continuous autofocus. Um, with manual override on my um, on my uh, um, um, on my setup, um, autofocus, so I can just grab focus instantly and then manually override it. But I usually fire a burst of images because I found with experience that um, you know nailing focus isn't always easy, and there's often a slight a fractional movement of the subject from wind or something like that. Very often, if you fire a burst of three or four images, you'll find one is sharper than the other. That's a really useful tip because um, eight frames per second allows you to fire a single shot as well if, you, if you've you know absolutely nailed your focus and are confident with that. But you can also fire a few if you need to. If you're using flash, just bear in mind you need to have that set up manually because um, if you've got it set up, um, automatic uh, flash, ETTL as can and call it, um, you'll get a pre-flash firing, which will uh, enable the flash to calculate the, the right uh, level of flash for the subject, right in inverted commas, and that will spook your subjects. Insects uh, on a warm day are very wary and very fast moving. If you fire a pre-flash, you'll find, you've, if you're lucky, you've got the tail of the butterfly or dragonfly leaving the frame as, you, as, you, as your shutter fires. Uh, if you are using flash, just remember you'll be using your sync speed or below, so probably 250th on most cameras, but maybe 300. Um, and I'm, as I said, I'm constantly checking as I'm moving around the site and adjusting as necessary. The one thing I'd start um, to, to advise beginners is to begin with the widespread species. There's, there's no point in spending hours and hours driving around the countryside trying to find something that's rare uh, or, or you know, really difficult to photograph. Best to start with the easiest subjects and, and refine your technique with those. Uh, and this is the meadow brown, and it's one of our commonest butterflies of grassland, uh, and it lays its eggs on a, a variety of grass species. Um, and it's relatively easy to photograph from early June onwards um, because it roosts near the ground, um, tends to roost on grass stems. And if you go early in the morning, and I mentioned I'm not good at getting up, so this was a, an aberration for me, uh, you should find uh, these little fellas um, at, at, you know, sort of two, uh, one, two feet off the ground, being very obliging and allowing you to get very close to them. Preferably, they'd be covered in dew or nicely backlit or newly emerged. And this is a newly emerged uh, specimen here um, in in June uh, in a meadow. I've I've just tried to give it a real meadow feel. There's some uh, yellow rattle on the right hand side just to give it a flavour, um, rather than just leave it as a completely blank canvas. I mentioned they are relatively easy to photograph. They do when they get warm, they do fly quickly. They're they're um, they're quite a big butterfly, and they're off as soon as they get warm, and then they can be very skittish. But generally, they're they're relatively easy to photograph. I would say that you can move on to the scarcer species once you've got a portfolio of images, and once you're happy, you know what you're doing. Um, this is the brown hair streak, and I'd say it's not a particularly easy butterfly to photograph because it's a woodland edge butterfly um, that spends most of its uh, adult life in the tree canopy. Uh, and very often you find uh, there's a site near relatively close to me about half an hour's drive um, where there's supposedly a colony of, of, of this species, which is an absolutely stunning butterfly. And I, I you know, it's for this reason this is this is why i'm desperate to photograph it every year and have thus far failed pretty badly um i've got no photographs of this species that i'm really pleased with um these are okay uh and they're quite interesting um this one here is laying she's a she's a female she's laying her eggs you can just see the little orange um 
bun-shaped egg being deposited on blackthorn. Um, so this is where you'll find them because the females will will be mated up in the tree canopy, maybe around a um, you know a tall ash or something like that in a in a hedgerow, and then the she'll come down. They'll come down in ones and twos, um, and searching diligently for this beautiful butterfly you think would be easy. But, um, you know, the flash of gold is a giveaway, but because they're there in low numbers, they can be hard to find. Um, so what makes a strong image? I, I mentioned I'm not happy with any of the images I've got of my um, brown hair streaks. But what makes a strong image? Well, I think it goes without saying with with this kind of photography, you're looking to you're, you're very up, you're up close and personal. You want it to be tack sharp. It wants to be. Ideally, a relatively clean background. I've put clean. This is, you know, pretty, pretty damn clean, really. Um, nice and out of focus. Um, you know, some interest there to give the viewer a, an impression of the habitat. Um, sometimes I'll include the habitat, but I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. Um, it wants to be nicely lit, and and I'll talk about lighting in in a minute. Um, and I would say it needs to look relatively natural. I'm not a fan of, of those horrible black nighttime style flash images that people often um, feel they need to do when they start, um, which is to use an overpowering flash uh, and no ambient lighting. I'm not a fan of those. So I won't be talking about that. I, if I do use flash, it's for fill on a maybe a cloudy day or perhaps a very bright day where I'm just trying to fill the, the shadows in. And it goes without saying it should be well composed. But what do we mean by that? Well, um, I've I've put this image up of a brimstone butter butterfly nectaring on ragged robin, which was taken while I was looking for marsh fritillaries in Colm Grassland last year. Um, and most of my images you'll see are taken at eye level. And I think most of the, the viewers who are familiar with wildlife photography and actually any portrait photographers amongst you will know that you've got far more impact um, with an image if you're shooting at eye level. It just gives the the subject um, some resonance with, with the viewer, I think. Um, the image is nicely balanced. It, I've used rule of thirds here. You wouldn't always, but but it's often a good starting point. Um, I've got some curves and diagonals going on here to to help to anchor the viewers' eye in the in the in the um, in the frame and to help to keep them interested. I, I guess, um, and obviously a some element of behaviour, whether it's mating or feeding or or or, or perching or whatever um, helps to add some interest and, and retain the viewer's interest. Let me talk a little bit more about sharp images because it's a problem that most beginner macro photographers struggle with. Um, this image here uh, is of uh, two mating um, em emerald damselflies um, and the wings are out of focus as you can see but that's because you're talking about you know, wingspan of about two inches, it would be impossible with a conventional macro lens to um, to get the wings and the bodies fully in focus. So I was content to let the the wings drift out. But what I did want here was the 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 whole of the insect duo, if that's the right phrase, to be absolutely pin sharp. So from the the head, the eyes, and that's you know, as with most wildlife or all wildlife photography, really, it helps to have the eyes in focus. Uh, generally, if you get that right, you've got something to start with. Um, but I wanted that to be true in both of these uh, insects here. But I also wanted the abdomens to be sharp uh, right the way through the image. And I've done that using a variety of techniques here. Now, I've mentioned I sometimes use autofocus. That's the kind of no-no with a lot of macro photographers. The received wisdom is you only use macro, for, uh, you only use manual focus. And there's been for years this, this uh, received wisdom that you rock backwards and forwards to get your subject in, in focus. I think that's a load of tosh. I, I absolutely don't do it. I, I don't, to be fair, I don't use a digital SLR anymore. I use mirrorless exclusively and I would never go back. Um, just too many advantages to using um, to using mirrorless. And one of the things that it does do, uh, although this was shot with a digital SLR, it gives you the ability to use um, a focus assist, which will tell you when the whole image is, um, is in focus. Um, 
in your frame, in your viewfinder, which is fantastic. So what I tend to do, my, my sort of go-to technique has always been to find um, a, a point in the middle of the uh, frame somewhere around here, nail that with uh, back button focus, and then to override it with manual focus using live view with a digital SLR, uh, and obviously in the frame with mirrorless. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll use manual, but manual override. Uh, you want a fast enough shutter speed, and I'll come on to stability in a minute and how you prevent that kind of subject movement. You want a fast enough shutter speed to nail a tack sharp image. So my starting point would be around 250th, uh, if I can get away with you know 500th or something like that. Um, I'll try and keep my ISO fairly low. Uh, I've mentioned I'll use a burst mode. Even when I'm shooting a relatively static subject like this, I'll want to maybe use a burst mode of three or four images because one of them is likely to be just slightly more in focus than the others, and that's the one you'll pick to, uh, to process. Um, this is probably the most important bit. Um, you will want to align your sensor, the back of your camera, with the subject because you've, you're working with a very, 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 very tiny, most of the time, uh, depth of field, plane of focus is very small. So if you've tilted your, uh, your sensor, the plane of your sensor, compared to your your subject, you'll find that parts of your subject will drift out. And it takes practice and you don't always get it right, but it's really important to try and remember. It's easy to do, it has to be said, when you're working with a stationary subject. So that brings me on to the subject of camera supports and stabilization um, and remote releases because they're all combined here. I'll say something about choosing the moment in a minute. Um, because I need to say something about stabilizing the subject first. I've talked about the plamps. It's one of my go-to bits of kit uh, if I'm carrying a tripod, because um, I often shoot handheld these days, and I'll come on to that shortly. The shot on the left uh, of Azure Damselflies, which is pin sharp from sort of head to abdomen, um, I've got the plane of focus absolutely right there. Uh, this was stabilized a little bit like this with the, the top uh, and the bottom of this um, a mare's tail stem being clamped uh, to a second tripod. And I've got a little kind of tiny thing that I bought once when I'd forgotten my tripod uh, in Venice, actually, um, which is a cheap and cheerful thing. It's very light and it just goes in my backpack and I find it really handy. You can use this, a ground stake, but to be honest, I don't. I prefer to use a tripod. It gives me the ability to clamp up two plamps. Why don't I put these on my existing tripod? Well, because you'll get camera shake and it will shake the subject and that will be transmitted through your hand with your finger on the shutter button um, or any kind of movement that you impart to your tripod um, and you will end up with camera shake of your subject. Let me just stay with this a second and just remind myself something I wanted to say about choosing the moment. You'll find even with a stabilized subject, you will get some movement probably, and you need to be looking through the viewfinder and just firing the shutter button, ideally with a remote release, but I sometimes use my finger on the shutter button myself. Um, when that shutter, when that uh, uh, specimen just falls into focus. So on to hand holding, I, I do a lot of hand holding, whether it's laziness or whether it's just because of the uh, image stabilization qualities of the Olympus system that I'm using. Uh, I'm not sure, probably the latter actually. I'm getting um, something like six or seven stops of image stabilization with these telephoto lenses um, and hand holding um, often with a, a, a monopod, but sometimes just freehand with the Olympus lenses is very doable. Uh, and it gives you the ability to be more flexible. I mean, people often say if you're using a tripod, you um, you know, it slows you down and you can concentrate on composition. That's true, but equally the opposite is true in that you're not as flexible and it's harder to explore different viewpoints um, and, and different scenarios. And, and this is a case in point. I probably wouldn't have taken this had I been uh, locked to a tripod. This was handheld. It's a Southern Hawk, a dragonfly, just photographed. Um, a one amongst a range of photographs that I was able to take hand holding using the Olympus 4150 with the extender. So sort of 420 mil focal length. So blows the background out beautifully. Um, and, you know, it hasn't got all the classic attributes of a, 
you know, an RPS, you know, uh, F or A standard image. Um, and I know through having done the associateship through the RPS that they do like everything to be absolutely pin sharp from front to back and top to bottom. Um, but I like it. It's a nice kind of creative image that gives a, a real feel for the nature of these beasties. Same is true of this one. Um, this is a pearl bordered fritillary uh, nectaring on a bluebell, uh, obviously. Um, and it's an image I'd had in my mind for a while. And it enables me to say something about pre visualization. The, the more you do this, the more you pre visualize images that you want to take with certain subjects. Uh, and I've known for a while that the, the beautiful orange color of this stunning, but sadly very rare butterfly would offset very well against the blue of bluebells. And they're on the wing around the time that bluebells are are in flower and this is a, a nice looking bluebell um and this shot uh, although it doesn't you know tick the 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 you know sort of conventional wisdom of everything being pin sharp focus all the way through um you know wings are drifting out here uh, it did what i wanted it to do which is just to give it a real soft feel around the outside of the frame and concentrate the viewer's eye in the middle and this was uh, highly commended by the british wildlife photography awards um same year I, I, I won the macro category, which is really nice. Let me say something about lighting, um, because lighting and macro uh, of insects can be really challenging. This is a downy emerald da uh, dragonfly. And tenoral or, or newly emerged uh, dragonflies are really, really shiny, as are many insects. And you can see I've struggled here to to control the reflectivity of the wings because it was a bright day. Um, and, you know, you've got often got no control over it. Often you go out thinking it's going to be perfect conditions, bright overcast and everything will be beautifully muted with no major reflections. And then you get there and you find the sky clears. The insects are moving really fast and you can't, you know, you're chasing them in vain. And when you do find something, it's the settled, you find it's just reflecting light at you left, right and center. In actual fact, with this image, I quite like it anyway, because, you know, it, it is part of the characteristics of the uh, the insect and consequently it's, um, you know, it's, it, it is what it is really. Uh, and I didn't lose too much. I've, I've got a few sun stars starting here, which I quite like really. And it is a stunning and, and actually fairly rare dragonfly. So uh, I was pleased to get any shots of this. Um, I mentioned muted lighting. That really, what you want is this. This is just superb, um, beautifully even lit. No harsh shadows. No blown highlights. Um, you know, soft lighting as if you've got a big white diffuser on top. And I will carry a diffuser sometimes if I've if I can be bothered to carry all the the gear that you sometimes find you need for for macro work. But um, this didn't need it because it was that wonderful bright overcast and this is a four spotted chaser dragonfly emerging um, just having emerged from uh, its larval case or its exuvia which I mentioned earlier was something something that I'll often look for if I'm out looking around ponds uh, and I, I included these two shots side by side to show you that um, just moving your viewpoint can sometimes re result in a completely different image. This is the same dragonfly um, about 20 minutes later um, shot uh, against the sun um, to highlight the beautiful um, venation in the wing here and these beautiful hairs around the the edge that are just picking up the early morning sun this is probably eight eight o'clock eight thirty in the morning on a as i say a bright overcast day and um, you can see here the effect of the backlighting and i've just could manage to control it with no blown highlights the early morning light and I've, I've said i don't get up early in the morning well i do sometimes and this is the kind of result you get this beautiful golden light we all know the golden hour um, and this is a newly emerged most dragonflies will emerge early morning uh, newly emerged uh, common data dragonfly with its wet um, wings it's obviously just crawled out of uh, the pond and you can see just strands here of uh, um, algae um, that the sort of horrible blanket weed um, but still adhering to it so a nice nice shot but made really by the light I think um, I also lied really I don't I do I obviously do get up early don't I because these are one of the most um, you know early risers of, of our butterflies 
you've got to be up early to catch these guys because they're on the wing late June around the the solstice. So, you know, you've got to be up at 4.30 really to get on site for sunrise, which is, you know, what, five o'clock in the morning. Marble White's one of my favourites. Uh, and these are shots of the beautiful effects you can get with low sun and backlighting on a blue sky. Um, you can just see the light coming through the translucent nature of the wing here on this pair and on this adult. I mean, very quickly you're over. So you're you're back home by eight o'clock in the morning because the light is often a too harsh and the insects are warmed up and on the wing. I mentioned um, uh, um, that that uh, marble white site um, while you're out in, in the right part of the country. This is down in Devon. Um, it's really worth looking out on long uh, overgrown grassland sites for these guys. Um, the, this is a, a great green bush cricket, one of our largest uh, invertebrates. And this is in the process of consuming its larval, its last larval instar, its last larval case. And uh, I wanted to try to capture this in situ, if you like, in, in, in its habitat, because that's, you know, it's very easy to get fixated on, on a small, um, you know, close up shot to, to reveal the detail. But this is really, um, you know, the, the habitat that you'd find it in. So it's found in, in tall grasslands um, and it's a spectacular insect, carnivorous insect that, uh, you know, if you come across it, it uh, can be really hard to photograph. But this morning, this was preoccupied with having breakfast. And this is another shot of it, a close up uh, shot. So I was pleased with this because this is absolutely pin sharp, crisp. Uh, and, you know, you can see the size of this and the antenna moving around all the time. They're constantly waving the antenna around. But as I say, he was preoccupied with breakfast, which was rather fortunate fortuitous. I mentioned flash earlier. I don't use flash that often, but I will carry a twin flash, diffused twin flash, um, to provide sometimes um, some effects on a, a dull day when really there's not much interesting light going on, um, or to, to fill in shadows on a bright day. And sometimes flash can be used particularly with dew covered insects, just to give it a little bit of a lift and to reveal some of the detail on the surface that perhaps wouldn't be uh, the case if you had backlighting. And this was a backlit shot and you can see these lovely bokeh balls are just reflecting off the dew on the grass behind. It's like almost a smoky feel of a common blue butterfly. I mentioned that I, I, I carry my, I mean, it would be insane not to, my, my uh, macro lens, 60 millimeter macro lens, so 120 mil focal length equivalent, um, which is so small, it's, uh, you know, insane not to carry it. But very often I find I'll shoot, especially, you know, when insects are on the move and they're warmed up with long lenses. And this was shot with my 600 equivalent focal length for 300 f4 which is about a kilo and and a bit and it's very very hand holdable it's, it's the same kind of weight as my old canon 70 to 200 f 2.8 um and made even steadier with a, a monopod but i very often find i'm just shooting uh, handheld it's just easy um the image stabilization with this is insane this is a uh, a broad-bodied chaser, a female, uh, who's just perched up between bouts of going to the pond to lay. Uh, and I was just able to shoot her through vegetation, which is something that you can do easily with a long lens because you're standing well back. So you can get close to the vegetation, look for a gap and just give this lovely sort of dreamy out of focus feel around the edge. It's a standard wildlife technique for shooting all sorts of animals, but works really well with insects. Um, Again, with a long lens, a really long lens, you can shoot, you know, way up. This was way up in the tree canopy, sort of 20 feet away with the uh, six, with the, I keep calling it 600. It, it is effectively um, the 300 F4 with an extender. So I've got a, an equivalent focal length of eight, over 800 mil. Um, and this is a, a hawk dragonfly doing what, what they do when they've newly emerged, which is to patrol woodland, woodland rides, um, feeding up exercising their flight muscles before they go back and hold territory over ponds, um, you know, after about a week or so of emerging. You can get insane really with, with long lenses. The shot on the left and, and these two were part of a test I was doing for the Olympus uh, MC20, uh, which is the 
times two converter coupled up with the 300 f4 it's given me an equivalent focal length of i think 1200 mil which is a bit mad really but it just goes to show that the quality is there these are handheld uh, of painted ladies that we had a big influx of last year that were nectaring in the garden uh, on on our Budlier bushes um, and the one on the left here wasn't taken with flash although you could be forgiven for thinking that um, it's actually backlit and the hedge behind was in shade in shadow um, but it just goes to show you know you you can I was sitting about 18 20 feet away so no chance of spooking the animals or the butterflies um, they were quite happy for me to just carry on taking pictures um, and very obliging they were too. The other thing you can do with these uh, with these things is get down fairly low and personal. And this is a, a shot or a sequence, part of a sequence of shots that I'm working on at the moment. It's not perfect by any means. And this is probably um, highlights one of the limitations of the Olympus micro four thirds system is in that I'm, I'm really willing to shoot it much above about 800 ISO. Now, obviously the lenses are pretty fast, um, and they give you a greater depth of field for, for the equivalent um, uh, aperture on a full frame camera. But really, I would have been happier with my Sony full frame um, and a, an ISO that I would have been quite happy to have punched up to 6, 4, uh, maybe even 12,000 plus. 12,800 to really get a fast shutter speed uh, and to nail the movement. I've just lost the, the abdomen. This is a broad body chaser laying and they've got a really odd um, way of laying. They come and dip down their abdomens into the water surface and it's very, very quick. Um, I was pleased to get this, uh, you know, but but even so, it's not quite as easy as photographing something like this, a laying uh, emperor dragonfly. Um, again, this was taken with the um, Olympus 300 F4 with the extender, well, 1.4 extender, um, lying while well, sitting in my bum in a pond or in the wet vegetation around the edge of a pond. You've got to do these things, haven't you, to, for your art. Um, but it's a shot I've been trying to take for a couple of years and really only possible with a long lens. Couldn't have done that with a macro because she was about 20 feet out in the middle of the pond. So a little bit of a crop, but more or less that's, that's you know, as taken. Um, on the same shoot, but a uh, different pond, um, a completely different approach. And sometimes, you know, worth emphasizing, we don't have to be purely pictorial. We can, uh, uh, you know, representative, we can be a bit more pictorial this is another uh, emperor female laying but head-on shot this time and very high key so i've just let the reflected light blow the, the the highlights on the water surface out and it just gives a much more graphic feel almost a monochrome feel i mentioned behavior earlier do try to capture behavior i've illustrated that a few times uh, one of the things with butterflies that i'm always looking to do is capture mating behavior uh, and this illustrates something that i wanted to highlight because you know there's a rule of thumb with wildlife photography the subject is more important than the photograph and this just illustrates something that would concern me in the field is that you can just see these two male and female common blues just starting to pull their abdomen apart they're getting stressed and that is a reason to leave them alone and it's also a reason to use a longer lens if you can rather than a short telephoto i would always be looking at something like for skittish animals you know i want to be working at you know a couple of feet away at least um but they they will start to tear their um uh reproductive organs if you're not careful and you know if you see this going on you need to move apart these two are coupled up pretty well um uh, there's no such problem here this is one of the rarest butterflies in the UK that I was privileged to find this mating pair of. Um, this is the Heath fritillary. We've got a population on Exmoor. This is uh, a, 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 one other in, in Devon. This was taken in Cornwall, one population in Cornwall. I think there's only five or six nationally. But to find a mating pair in such a nice set of circumstances was really pleasing. Um, the only thing I, I didn't do and, and should have done, I wasn't carrying any clamps with me and I couldn't take for, the, for that reason because it was quite windy. I couldn't take um, a stacked image. I'd like to have done that. But they stayed together for about 10 minutes and let me photograph them, which was very 
pleasing. Um, I mentioned Scrub Edge right at the beginning of the talk. Um, you want to look when you come across willow or birch scrub for, for um, you know, different life stages of insects. This is a, an eyed hawk moth larvae. Uh, you can see here doing its best to mimic a sallow leaf and um, they're spectacular large larvae and can be surprisingly difficult to find. But when you do, you know, they do make a fantastic subject. So don't neglect the, uh, uh, the, the larvae, um, different life stages, because they can be they can add a you know, completely different dimension to your macro portfolio. Um, this is a small elephant hawk moth larvae nibbling away uh, uh, on a leaf here. And I've just, I could have, and I did in fact, photograph the whole larvae uh, from, you know, and wanted to get the tip to tail in focus. But this was just a slightly different image. I wanted to give the, uh, the, the viewer a, a real flavor for the character of the insect. I think that was best done by looking at head end. Um, and just being able to to capture some of the detail the markings on the head which are quite spectacular these are sawfly larvae and again these are on willow um and uh they're quite acute things really they they lay them in these groups if you're lucky enough to come across them uh, you'll find this is a sort of conventional view of them, but they will on occasion do do this rather strange, presumably anti-predation kind of um, attitude, which is very odd. And they just sit there quite obligingly. I've got a clamp, a clamp at the top and at the bottom here, just keeping this whole thing uh, parallel so I could get the plane of focus right, getting the subjects in focus from top to bottom. So that was just nice to see as well. I mentioned that I would say something about stacking because stacking is something that we're doing. I'm doing more of now that um, the capability of cameras is changing. Um, I mentioned uh, that I use Sony alongside my Olympus. I've got a full frame uh, a7 III and I'm looking at the a7R III as well uh, or the four at some point for wildlife photography. But I can't tear myself away from Olympus for uh, for macro, partly because it's so incredibly portable and partly because it has this incredible in-camera stacking function, which is just superb. Now, I know there are other cameras that do do, do stacking. I've not used the Nikon D850, for instance, which I know has a stacking function uh, or the Panasonic systems. But the, the advantage of the Olympus for me is that you can set it up once you get to know the system really so you can shoot almost on the hoof. Um, providing you've got a tripod and it's very very quick this is a feathered thorn moth this was actually taken under controlled conditions um, with a wee macro rail but uh, in the field you know you'll be able to shoot something like that in less than a second now this insect is this is the shot that I told you I I um, photographed for in my garden for the which won the British Wildlife Photography Awards the uh, macro category hidden britain a couple of years back and um, this was taken actually handheld uh, sorry hand stacked um, and basically what i did it was with my old canon system the 5d mark IV and the 180 macro which is a tack sharp lens um, but a bit heavy on a big tripod and i just focused here uh, manually uh, at the front of the spider, because there was no wind, it wasn't moving, it was being incredibly obliging. It's a nursery web spider. And I just focused very slightly into the frame, moving through the frame, just moving the barrel of the lens uh, increments, tiny, tiny increments, taking a shot each time. And eventually I got to the, the end and I got everything in focus and I thought, okay, that, that'll, that'll do me. And in that time, the insect hadn't moved and it was able to, I got about 40 images, which emerged later uh, in the Helicon Focus uh, stack piece of stacking software. And over about three or four stacks, I got one that worked. Some of them were slightly out, the, the spider moved slightly um, or a little tiny puff of wind that just moved the one of the frames out of sync. But it, it worked and it just showed me how effective hand stacking can be. Um, the shot on the left was taken with the Olympus. Um, got about uh, 12, 13 images here. This is Chalk Hill Blues, a roosting pair um, on a very windy day. And, and the reason I include this is because um, 
I'm now I know the system and I'm really used to it. I can I can nail this in less than a second because the image stack is shot so fast. Um, and you can see how effective this is. It's nailed absolutely everything in focus beautifully. I got the plant clamp down at the bottom of the ribwort plantain stem here, but the subject was still moving. Um, so it was just a question of waiting for the right moment, firing the stack. Had to fire about four or five stacks. You need a big memory card, uh, potentially. Um, but it worked. I got one of the stacks uh, that was absolutely spot on. This is a, a common blue on a, a common spotted orchid stem and it would have benefited hugely from stacking, but it was really, really windy and I was lucky to get one shot off. Two examples here, one of a stacked image, uh, uh, an angle shades moth, and you can see how much depth of field I've got there, including the bulk of this um, image here. And this is uh, an old shot I took um, of a single shot of a crab spider with a meadow brown butterfly. And I just let the wingtip drift out of focus. I just couldn't nail it, which is a shame. I think with stacking, that would have been absolutely perfect. Another sp a spider here, uh, a, an orb weaver spider, um, yellow orb weaver, quite uh, an unusual spider um, subspecies of the common garden one you find, um, but nailed the focus all the way through, um, no problem at all. Um, was able to use a shallow depth of field because that's the other thing with stacking. You can use a really shallow depth of field F4, F5.6 to blow that background out because the problem with, I didn't mention it earlier, but the problem with using a very narrow um, aperture is that you start to get the background drifting in, which can cause the image to look very cluttered. So stacking has its serious advantages if you're in a bit of a cluttered environment. Um, this was uh, in the garden. This is a Jersey tiger, and it just goes to show the level of detail that you can reproduce, um, which you couldn't really get easily with uh, conventional macro photography. So I was able to could really control that depth of field and lose the the clutter behind really focusing the viewer's eye, I hope, on the subject. Same here with this uh, uh, elephant hawk moth, small elephant hawk moth. And you can see here, I couldn't have done this with the conventional macro. I've got the whole perch in focus uh, because the subject is photographed obliquely. Again, stacked about 15 images, uh, something like that, which were assembled later in um, Photoshop. I should say the uh, in 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 the uh, on the computer. I should say that the Olympus will stack these in camera as a series of JPEGs. But personally, I prefer to shoot raw and have total control over this later in post processing. This is a uh, similar uh, same day actually, um, just after the moth trap had yielded its contents. So it just goes to show you can get some good stuff in your garden. I mentioned stacking software. I personally use Helicon Focus. Um, I've got Xerine Stacker as well. It's got its, they've got their pluses and negatives, um, but I find Helicon a bit more intuitive and easier to use. There are, uh, I, I must say, these are not the only focus stacking software packages available. There are free images as well available online. And uh, I've never tried those, but I've tried these two and, and can recommend them. They're good. Um, so I think, guys, that is the end of my talk, and that is the final slide. So if I stop sharing now, maybe we can go back to um, the guild and we can open up for some some questions. If anybody's got any uh, any questions to ask, and we have got lots of questions. So thank okay. you. Really, really interesting, and your images are outstandingly beautiful. I usually want to shy away from insects because I'm a little bit squeamish, but you're <laughs> absolutely stunning. The 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 dew droplets is it's outstanding. The Thank you. detail, which we've had lots of lovely comments coming through, um, and we've got a few questions as we say. So image stacking, is this taking multiple shots at different exposures? No. It's taking multiple shots at exactly the same exposure. But what you do, I probably should have explained this a bit more clearly, and I apologize for not doing it during the talk. But essentially what you're doing is you're take you're using the um the ability of uh you're you're taking advantage of still conditions, relatively still conditions, to be able to shoot a sequence of images or slices through the image. 
Uh, so you could end up with, well, uh, I mean, I could show you, I haven't got any in here because I didn't think we had time, but I often shoot in the studio up to 200 images. And they are essentially very thin slices through an image to enable you to really maximize your depth of field. And when you're working very close up, the you know the closer you are to a, a subject the tinier the depth of field when you're working very close up particularly post you know bigger than life size and certainly using microscope objectives your depth of field is less than a miller far far less than a millimeter mm -hmm. and the problem with that is you you just couldn't get enough of the subject in focus to to make it a meaningful visual subject so you need to shoot slices which you then stack together in the in camera in that stacking software that i've just mentioned and the exposure is exactly the same that's really important because what you want is for the final image to look um you know absolutely perfect so no it's not a stack of different exposures it's a stack of slices through the image using uh, a shallow depth of field to increase your depth of field does that do you think answers your question i think so yes i certainly do okay. that's brilliant um, we've got a couple in regards to the butterflies as well, which appeared mm. earlier on. Um, do you use your 300 mil lens for them? It's a, I use my 300 mil. I mean, I've called this a macro workshop. I? I was when I was assembling the images, I thought, wow, actually, a lot of this is just long, long lens telephoto photography because the 300 f4 Olympus focuses so ridiculously close. It's got a um, you know it's not quite one-to-one -one macro which is really the the definition of macro photography but it's not far off it's about 0.7 with the extender which is nearly life size so you can stand two feet away three feet away and fill the frame with your butterfly so i find it an incredibly versatile lens um, and it's one of the reasons why i'd find it i've believe me i've had so many camera systems over the years and i've spent so much time on ebay and i'm sure there's probably a lot of people going oh god yes i know exactly what you mean and i still do it i mean i've got all my gear down here i mean i've got i've got my olympus and I've got Sony and I'm thinking, do I get rid of the, the Olympus 300 F4 and chop it in for the Sony 200, 400, uh, 600? Because it would just do some aspects of my wildlife photography better than yeah. the Olympus. But then I really like the Olympus and it's great for macro, particularly for butterflies. So in answer to your question, absolutely, it's a superb butterfly lens because it's absolutely razor sharp. It's got great uh, image stabilization and it's a really light lens. It's easy to handhold. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, we have another one from Carol. Do you move around to follow the butterflies or do you pick a spot <laughs> and wait for them? Ah, that's a very good. My camera, they've usually gone. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, and, you know, one, you could probably expand on this talk and do it for two hours because field craft is a subject all of its own and uh, butterflies can be really, really difficult. There's a, a, a good rule of thumb is to photograph, go out and photograph when the weather's cool. Now, I mentioned uh, one of the shots I showed you earlier was the pearl bordered fritillary mm -hmm. and the advantage of shooting pearl bordered fritillary is that it emerges early in the season. It, you know, it's on the wing from about mid-April onwards. And um, what happens in mid-April? Temperatures are lower. And what happens when temperatures are lower? Butterflies don't move as fast. And it's far easier to answer your question to yeah. photograph butterflies at that time of year yeah. than in July when, and as I mentioned with the marble whites, the sun's up at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and the butterflies, are, and then that way madness lies. You're chasing these things across the field, <laughs> looking like an, a complete idiot. And every time you stop to try to photograph them, they've moved again. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is to get out early in the morning and to try to, to catch them and photograph them when they're relatively cool. The... Um, the, the exception to that is when they're doing something like mating when they will stay stationary and you have then got the chance to get closer um, and photograph them while they're doing something but yes it, it is about trying to think about behavior and that really comes back right back to the beginning of the talk which is yeah. when i said you've got to understand your subject and that's true of all wildlife yeah. i think yeah yeah brilliant so i don't Great run message. around too much like an idiot but <laughs> there have been times when i will <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant. Um, is there a particular monopod that you'd recommend? 
Uh, well, I'm using Olympus gear, so the lighter the better. I've got a, a little Manfrotto monopod, which I think is a little light carbon monopod, which um, I keep meaning to do a review of because I, I use a Wimbley head with it. Wimbley make a, a really amazing kind of um, gimbal kind of head for, for a monopod, which enables me to uh, to, to use the... Um, the long lens with a monopod without the frustrations of a ball head. A ball head and a monopod, just a nightmare. But this monopod, it allows you to side mount the lens. So you've got complete rotation of the lens and you can follow the subject when it's moving, but you've got a monopod for stability. So I, and then of course with the monopod, you can just pick the, the lens up and use it handheld. I sometimes shove the base of the monopod into my waistband. Mm -hmm. So I've got it almost like a kind of an extra extra arm. So, yeah, it's just a a, um, a carbon smallest carbon Manfrotto monohead with a, a monopod with a with a little weird gimbal head, which I keep meaning to do a review of on my website. Yeah. So keep checking my website or Facebook page. I'll do a review okay. at some point. Took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to ask you where we could find it when you've done it. Right. So we've got one from Nikki. Lovely work, Andrew. I've not yet attempted any macro photography yet, she says, but keen to give it a go. I shoot with Nikon D850 and have a Tamron 90mm that I was hoping to try. Is that going to mean I can't get close enough in terms of having to crop in post? And will it be a good one to start with? Uh, yeah, it's great, isn't it? I mean, it's a great camera. I've never used it. I've used the, uh, and I've owned, this is where I go back to my eBay days, uh, <laughs> the, the Nikon D810. And I know it's a superb camera and it's it's got great crop ability because it's it's got high megapixel count. So you've got that ability to stay a bit further back, which gives you the advantage of having a slightly higher depth of field, which is great for macro. Um, so you're you know standing back slightly and then crop in post a little bit, uh, which, you know, we all do anyway. And it's not a bad thing to get into the habit of. I think you one of the, the uh, mistakes I see people making with macro photography is getting in too close. And then they've ended up with a very tight image or tight subject with hardly any border. Far better to crop and be creative later yeah. when you've got time than go in too close and lose your depth of field. Mm -hmm. So great camera. Um, the Tamron 90mm macro is great. Um, I don't know whether it's got the capability of having an extender fitted to it. A lot of macro lenses don't have. If you have, or an extension tube, something like that, maybe if you want to get in even closer. But it's a good combination, definitely. Um, but get up early and, you know, get out while the insects are not moving around as fast as well. That's a, that's a good thing. But yeah, great combination. Absolutely superb. You'll get razor sharp images. Fabulous. Brilliant. Great news. Um, just as you're talking about extension tubes, Stephen is asking whether you use them. No, I find them a pain in the neck, to be quite honest, because <laughs> I, I, I have owned them. I like, have owned virtually every piece of camera equipment in the universe, <laughs> in the known universe. I'm sure there are other pieces of camera equipment in parallel universes that I've not yet come across. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, extension tubes, I've had a love-hate relationship with them because I've always shot... Um, my, my sort of default technique has always been to um, use back button focus. Uh, it comes from my wildlife days before pre-macro. Back button focus to nail the focus using autofocus and then adjust the, or fine tune the focus with, ma with, with manual. And if you're using extension tubes, very often you lose that um, autofocus capability uh, or, it, or you've got the, uh, you know, very, um, you haven't got that full range of, of auto of, of focus that you would have with a full lens and therefore you can find yourself hunting for focus and I just I can't be bothered life's too short actually buy the right camera equipment and use a long lens long lens photography uh, with with things like the Sony and the, the Canon 100 400 lenses um, the zoom lenses which many of us have for wildlife or landscape work are brilliant for macro for larger insects and unless you're doing, you know, itsy bitsy, tiny little insects, they're they're great general, you know, all purpose macro lenses. And they're well, not they're not macro lenses, but they're they're almost taking over as macro lenses. Mm. If you want to get really close, you can use um, extension tubes. Sure. But I've got my uh, ultra macro from Lower, which is a Chinese company, um, which I could use. But there's only so much time in the day, really. So. Okay. No, not the answer is no, not very uh, often. Yes. Um, right. Hope that answers your question. Great. 
we do have a question to go alongside that is what which one would you recommend <laughs> uh what extension possibly, tubes possibly, yeah possibly none of them <laughs> well no i mean i i do know people that do use them but the one thing i would say is that they are basically just a tube so don't spend a massive amount of money yeah. on them because yeah. it's just a mechanical coupling at either end um and given you're only buying a hollow tube there's no point in paying top dollar for a canon or a nikon when you could buy something like a kenko and i've owned all of those so i know so yeah and i don't own any at the moment i probably wouldn't bother but um yeah you know other people do but i wouldn't spend a lot of money i'd buy a cheap one off ebay yeah okay great brilliant advice um so a question in regards to all of the camera equipment you've had i wonder if you can give this one an answer God. which mirrorless is your preferred choice uh it's really hard to i mean i'm currently using um i've got a full uh, olympus system and i would say that being an olympus mentor but i spend most of my time when i'm not taking pictures agonizing that i've got the wrong gear and i'm sure there are a lot of people that's <laughs> sitting there thinking yes 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 i know exactly what he means i'm not the only one thank god i don't need to go into therapy um so I, I it's horses for courses isn't it you know yeah. the olympus is is fantastic it's light micro four thirds system i changed from full frame about three years ago and i've been really really pleased with it but it does have its downsides and i think that it, that downside is high iso performance which means that generally i don't use auto iso and i know a lot of people now are using auto iso yeah. set up manually shutter speed uh, aperture leave the ISO to fall where it may because the ISO performance on something like the Sony, you know, the, the, the top end Sony is so good now that you can really shoot up to 6.4, maybe even 12.8 with really not much noise penalty. And there's this yearning for high ISO performance that I find that I have, particularly if I'm shooting wildlife, uh, you know, I've got a dipper project on um, at the moment mm -hmm. where I'm shooting down in a gorge in a, in a, in a you know, fairly unsunlit location. And it's always nice to have extra ISO and, you know, but you can pay top dollar for full frame lenses, you know, and that way madness really does lie. 500 mil F4, new Sony, 10 grand, isn't it? It's a lot of money. So, you know, uh, the the best to answer your question, the best mirrorless camera system is the one that A, you can afford and B, does the job for you. And for the most part, 95% of my shooting, 90% of my shooting, it's the Olympus system. But I've also got a Sony, a full uh, spectrum converted Sony, which enables me to shoot infrared. And also, if I put the right filter on it, pure daylight as well. It's an A7 III. It's got great ISO performance. I, I might buy the 200, 600 um, Sony lens to go with it because it might just be really handy for wildlife and it's quite cheap. So you can run two together and I think I will probably always do that. Um, so I've got, you know, the Sony mirrorless and the Olympus mirrorless and that seems to be quite a nice match. Right. So, yeah. Don't know if that answers the question, but please don't, you know, on the back of this, go and sell all your go camera back. equipment. Yeah. It's, what, it was, it's what's good for you, you know. Yeah, great. Lovely. And um, we've got another from Neil. Do you do studio training workshops for stacking? Uh, I do do workshops. I do one to ones. Um, I'm thinking of doing some stacking uh, tutorial work next year. One of the problems with studio stacking is you're working with dead insects generally um, because insects, you know, have a habit of moving unless they're pretty cold. Um, sometimes you come across something really stationary. I do most of my stacking these days in the field um, when you're taking advantage of the Olympus's ability to fire a stack of 10, 12 images really quickly in, within less than a second. Um, but my studio stacking, which you know I could show you images of where I'm taking pictures of, they are dead, unfortunately, but I, I used to do a lot of entomological surveys. So I've got a whole case full of pinned insects that we used to sample and survey for ecology surveys because it's the only way to ID some of them. Um, so I've, I, I've got a, a macro stacking rail and a, an ultra macro lens. And sometimes we'll shoot up to 200 images, which could take half an hour, 40 minutes to do. So, yes, I could in theory, uh, uh, but I haven't yet. Uh, but it may be something I offer next year. But if anybody's interested in one-to-ones, um, go to my website, um, send me an email. Uh, I'm quite happy to put bespoke workshops together, 
you know, very reasonable cost. Brilliant. Yeah, that's great. That's really, really great. And we'll be able to, um, if you are a Guild member tuning in tonight, I know there is a lot of you with us, um, we will list the recording on to in the usual place in the webinar library. And what I'll do is I'll make sure that Andrew's links are there as well so that you can go on through and um, get in touch if you would like to do those. Um, I'm sure there'll be you. plenty of offers. Um, so that's all for questions. We had a couple in on email before the session started, but you've already answered those. So it's Great. brilliant. Um, absolutely fantastic. So you've had lots and lots and lots of lovely comments through to say Good. thank you. Excellent images. Andrew, loved your images, the composition, the sharpness and focus, the fascinating subjects. Going to try out and focus stacking at the first opportunity. So plenty of appreciation coming your way. Good. Glad people have enjoyed it. Yes, they have. Thank you so much. And this is the point where we tie up, which is a shame because we could just keep going. So thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. Thank you so much again, Andrew. Pleasure. And take care, everyone, and stay safe. Superb. Thanks thank a lot. Bye. Cheers. Bye.